Staying true to yourself is perhaps the biggest struggle. Our strengths are so often coupled with our weaknesses. The things that makes us particularly weird can be the things that if we can tap into it, we can be our best self. Hey y'all, I'm Ryan Devlin and welcome to the Struggle Climbing Show, where I talk with elite climbers about their struggles and breakthroughs in training, nutrition, tactics, and mental game, and also what they're passionate about beyond the fight with gravity. Now today's episode is legend, wait for it, dairy, as we chalk up for a chat with the man, the myth, and indeed the legend, Peter Croft. You know, it's hard to overstate the impact that Peter has had on the sport of rock climbing and on inspiring generations of climbers, including this starstruck podcast host. He is an incredibly well-rounded climber, though perhaps best known for his impressive free solos, many hundreds, maybe thousands of them at this point, including, of course, Astro Man and the Rostrum in Yosemite, an accomplishment so groundbreaking in the climbing world at that time that it was kind of like when Honold soloed El Cap. It was thought to be impossible until it happened. And that's just commonplace for Peter Croft. Among his other notable climbs are the first free ascent of Moonlight Buttress in Zion, Venturi Effect in the High Sierra, and Solar Flare on Incredible Hulk. Over a 40-plus year career, I could spend all day talking about what Peter has climbed, so I'm just going to wrap it up with a couple other mind-boggling accomplishments on big walls. He was the first to link up El Cap and Half Dome in a day, which he did with his good friend John Backer, and that was mega. And he was also the first to on-site the Shadow in Squamish, which is a stunning 513 that went unrepeated as an on-site for more than 30 years, and I'm telling you, some really big names tried to do it. Peter is an absolute master of endurance and efficiency, born from decades of soloing up and down routes and linking up incredibly long traverses. There's just no other climber in the world as intimately familiar with movement over rock than Peter is, especially when it comes to multi-pitch granite and crack climbing. He is incredibly impressive, of course, but that is only dwarfed by how humble this guy is. I just couldn't believe how cool it was to spend a few hours with him. And this conversation is so full of wisdom and genuine stoke. I know it's going to fill up your heart. It certainly did mine. So y'all, just a few days after I laid down this interview with Peter, I went out to get on the never-ending fall prod that I've been sharing with you guys over the course of this entire season. Jesus wept this stunning 12D at the red, and lo and behold, I sent. And it was beautiful, you guys. I mean, just a total flow state achieved, almost effortless climbing on this route that had been the biggest struggle in my climbing life. And do I give just a little bit of credit to Peter? Yeah. I do. For real, I do. Because as you'll hear in our chat, he puts a ton of value on seeking fun rather than grades. And I went into the day just focused on having fun. I'm going to talk more about this in a future episode, but I wanted to share the good news with you all. And I also wanted to thank and shout out the sponsors of The Struggle who have been helping me to achieve this new milestone in my climbing. They are the best. Please support them. And I promise you're going to see some results. First off, Fizzy Vantage, the official climbing nutrition sponsor of The Struggle. I use all of their amazing science-backed performance-enhancing products, and they have really helped me to train harder, recover faster, and climb better than I ever have before. Yo, I start my day out with their collagen to keep my fingers strong and injury-free, and then for Jesus Wept, I downed some of their Endurex to support my endurance and fast recovery between attempts, as well as Crush to give me a little jitter-free energy and focus while on the route. Fizzy Vantage founder Eric Hurst has become a good friend of mine over the years here, and I'm really grateful for that. And he happened to be at the Red when I sent, so we met up over at Miguel's for a congratulatory send beer, which was just the perfect way to wrap up a perfect day. Eric founded Fizzy Vantage to help all climbers, from pros to weekend warriors like myself, to level up. It is working for me, and I know that you're going to see some results as well if you give it a shot. Just check it out. Hit that link in your show notes or use code STRUGGLE15 at checkout for 15% off at fizzyvantage.com. 
The official gear sponsor of The Struggle is Petzl, and on send day, I strapped in with the Arundos harness, which is a light, comfy, and pretty badass looking harness. My beta on the route was to skip the draw in the high crux, because clipping it kind of disrupted my flow through that pretty technical section, and also I found that it was a much softer and safer fall without clipping that bolt, rather than having it clipped and then getting spiked into the wall there. So at least for me, that was my beta. And I took tons of falls in my Harundos harness, which kept me comfy and safe. And on that send go, it certainly didn't weigh me down. It is light, it is comfy. It's the best harness that I've ever tried. So if you're in the market for a new harness, check that one out or the others that Petzl makes to support various styles of climbing as well as various types of climbers. Look for them all at your local gear shop and pop by Petzl.com to access the inaccessible. And lastly, a big thanks to Friction Labs for keeping my fingers from sliming out of the mono, the two finger pockets, the quarter pad edges, and all the other holds as I joyfully pulled through those cruxes on the Proj. Their secret stuff liquid chalk kept my hands dry as I spent a full 20 minutes on the route resting for long bouts between crux sections by dragging my palms on some sloper jugs Man, I needed those recoveries. And then a little quick hit of their Gorilla Grip got my fingers primed for pulling hard when the time came. There are no fillers, no rosin, or drying agents, which means it lasts longer, and it keeps your skin healthy. Friction Labs loves helping climbers to perform at their best, which is why they're going to let you try their stuff risk-free so that you can see the difference. Enter code STRUGGLE20 at checkout for 20% off your first order. Chalk up less and climb more with Friction Labs. All right, let's dive into things, shall we? Big thanks to all of you patrons out there who are listening right now and who are supporting me as I work really hard to bring you all the content that I hope brightens your day and improves your climbing. If you are in a position to support the show, I would love to hook you up with some cool perks as a patron, and I'm gonna share more about that at the tail end of this episode. But first, let's hit the flow state with a climber that Royal Robbins himself referred to as his hero, Peter Croft. All right, Peter, look, my first question for you is what's more challenging, on sighting the shadow or setting Google Chrome up on your computer? Well, I certainly didn't on site this. So, yeah, climbing is uh, much simpler than uh, technology. Yeah, well, you were very patient um, as we got that worked out. And, uh, you know, honestly, this has been, I mean, I almost lost an entire episode with Tommy Caldwell and Alex Magos as well. And so um, I do think that maybe in some instances climbing is... Uh, a little bit easier than dealing with the intricacies of recording high quality audio. But here we are, uh, Peter Croft. I'm so, so psyched to be talking to you. I'm really grateful that you're taking the time here. It was our buddy Jordan Cannon, of course, that uh, connected us. Jordan was on season one, talked a lot about how he worked with you in his early days of kind of pushing himself from the nest and uh, becoming really serious about climbing and that you had a huge impact on him when he worked with you and hired you as a guide, uh, as, as he explained in our episode. Uh, I was just talking with Jordan. I think he's down in Mexico right now. He's, he's getting strong on some sport routes. It's been really fun to see him uh, progress and not just uh, as a climber. Like in the beginning, he was, I mean, I guess he still is kind of like the hungry puppy, but he's sort of reined it in a bit or, or at least got the, the puppy under control a bit more. And, and that's good to see because it was... Basically, there was some really close calls early on, and obviously, you know, we wanted to stay safe. Yeah, he left a, a little bit of his shin bone on uh, Wet Lycra Nightmare not too long ago, as as he had um, shared through some posts. It kind of took that, like, super weird, um, I mean, like, what are the chances of, of taking a fall? And and his leg went, like, into a hole in the wall that's, that was like small. It was like a leg-sized hole is what he managed to fall into. It was, it was pretty crazy. What an incredible climb, though. He had, he texted me a picture of that. Yeah, I mean, he's... Boy, the, the, the things that's happened to that guy without any like serious repercussions is um, is kind of amazing. I, I don't know if you know some of the other things, you know, taking a massive fall off El Cap and um, taking a sport climb here around Bishop where he broke 
two or three draws and smacked into the ground. And I mean, he even had to go to the hospital once as a result of making a sandwich. And there's like a bunch of accidents like that where I've climbed massively longer than him. And it, at least so far, I've never had to be hospitalized because of a, you know, making a meal. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's so funny, that story about the sandwich. He hadn't told me about that, but it's what, one of my um, worst climbing related injuries was uh, I was out climbing in the needles and it was like, you know, 3 a.m. We were getting a, a real early start and I was making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And the only knife that we had was a pocket knife and it was crazy sharp and I was spreading the peanut butter and I sliced my thumb wide open and I ended up having to pack it with chalk and put tape all around it. And, <laughs> you know, we went out and did five pitches on this this really cool moderate, which is all I am able to climb when it comes to trad, um, called White Punks on Dope. I just, I love the exposure out there in the needles. It's just uh, like such cool rock and and really exciting, adventurous climbing, two-hour approaches, bushwhacking up these. You feel exposed. Yeah, you got you got to go back because as long as you can climb like 5'9 or easy 5'10, um, you can just do some of the very best things there. You know, some some areas you go to, to get on the good routes, you have to climb at a really high level. But the needles, I mean, it's not really any good if you climb 5'7 or 5'8, but if you can climb 5'9 or, or you know, 5'10, it's... um it just changes and it's it's absolutely incredible. Oh, that's great to hear. I, I will check it out. I, I only had that one trip out there. I was, uh, I'm in Kentucky now, but I um, started climbing when I was living in Los Angeles. And so I spent a lot of time up in, you know, talk eats and suicide rocks and, yeah. you know, Idlewild and then out at, at Josh, uh, of course, and then only took the one trip to the needles there. And it was yeah. my favorite the, the, trip. I mean, punk, white punks, is it, it is good, but boy, you get up in the main needles and it's just way more impressive. It's way higher quality. Oh, um, cool. I remember the first time I was about to go there, I was in Twalmney Meadows and I ran into John Backer, a buddy of mine really wanted to go to the needles. And I'm, I went up to John and I said, you know, I'm thinking of going to the needles. Do you think I should bother? I mean, I'm here in Tuolumne and I'm right close to Yosemite Valley. You know, do you think it's even worth it? And he kind of paused just for a second. Then he, he looks around and he goes, you know, all this stuff here. If you put the needles down in the middle of it, we wouldn't even bother with this other shit here. Um, oh, I mean, man. in other words, the needles is just like, it's a whole nother level. I, I've been bugging my friend uh, Conrad Anker to go to the needles for years. And I kept on saying, you know, it's the best granite climbing ever. And he was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just, you know, blowing smoke. And then we went there eventually and climbed for a, f a few days. And afterwards he goes, yep, that's the best granite in the world. No um, kidding. So, yeah, it's it is that good. So and yeah, and you've only just had a, a tiny taste. So lucky you. Got a lot more to look forward to. Yeah, I'm psyched. Well, you got me. Uh, it's it's funny because a few years ago, um, my family moved from Southern California to Kentucky, and so now my crag is is the Red River Gorge. And That's I'm, not too bad either. <laughs> It's it's not bad. I'm getting real hyped on sport climbing and steep, powerful climbing, which was not a style that I was accustomed to being a bit of a trad dad out in Southern California, you know, so I'm getting strong and, and, and a little bit more dynamic and powerful, but my heart calls out for granite and, and jams and taped up hands and all that. The, the, the red is just some of the most amazing sport climbing on the continent, but at the same time, you know, the, the window of excellent conditions is really quite small. And, you know, I mean, like where I live in, in Bishop, basically it's a 12 month climbing season, you know, because we can, in the winter climb down low and then in the summer when it's hot, climb up high. And um, yeah, the ability to sort of chase the seasons um, all within say a hundred miles or less, and usually a lot less than that is pretty sweet. Yeah. I mean, it's become it's become one of the destinations. It's interesting with, with, you know, talking with Jonathan Segrist recently, and of course, Alex and, and some others kind of establishing the Vegas area as, as a little bit of that as well. They can get up to, you know, Mount Charleston and they can do some kind of higher altitude stuff in the summer. And then of course, in the winter, it's, it's all really good there and, yeah. and Potosi and around Red Rocks and some great routes there. I, I did my first kind of big multi-pitch um that i did was epinephrine uh, oh, there in vegas and that, that was awesome total blast yeah oh it's just yeah i just couldn't believe it you couldn't wipe the smile off my face it took us it was a party of three 
I think it took us about 12 hours on the it's climb. Gigantic. It's gigantic. It's a huge route. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. But I remember Alex kind of burning me a bit on it because I think he ended up doing it in like 38 minutes or something like that, you know, one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you guys that don't have to worry about pesky ropes and those kinds of things, it's a little different, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, doing it as a party of three in a day is actually pretty damn good. Um, I mean, plenty of people in a party of two have to bivy on it. Um, so dealing with uh, an extra person on that, I mean, for myself, if somebody suggested doing it as a party of three, I'd be like, oh, I don't know. Is that sounds like an awfully long day so you know good for you guys for making it happen oh well thank you for saying that yeah it was it was just such a good time and and speaking of good times i i am really excited i want to dive in with you peter because this is just such a rare opportunity to tap into the mind and the heart of somebody who has made a really enormous impact on the sport that we all love and your climbing accomplishments are on a level of their own, but you also just have a really unique perspective uh, that spans decades now. So let's dive in. Let's look at things through the lens of struggle. And I guess my first question is just that for you, Peter. What's your relationship with struggle? What does struggle mean to you as a climber? Boy, pretty much everything to do with climbing. And the struggle of... Uh, I guess weighing sort of the importance of um, whether you want to be noticed for being good or whether you really want to understand what the activity is. Um, it, it's For myself, it seems like whenever I've tried to attain a certain grade or to be perceived as a good climber, I've stalled out. And when I've tried to understand what climbing is, like fully understand the movement and... Um, the headspace and all that, that's when I, I, uh, I don't want to say excel necessarily, but I get way better. And then that coupled with, with inspiration. And so trying to I guess, stay true to who you are. And I think that's really important, no matter what kind of a climber you are or what your personality is like, understanding that uh, staying true to yourself is perhaps the biggest struggle. And with that, I mean, the thing is, our strengths are so often coupled with our weaknesses. The things that makes us particularly weird can be the things that if we can tap into it, we can be our best self. But coupled with that sometimes is, say, being too dogmatic about something or ignoring all else in your pursuit of a certain goal. Well, there's a downside to that. But trying to find a balanced way to, to uh, embrace your weirdness. And uh, for me, that's a struggle probably more than anything else. I mean, I struggle with off -wits. I completely suck at climbing on plastic. But overall, the biggest struggle is to kind of forget how you're perceived, um, forget about, say, a certain grade. And again, I'm not trying to say this is some universal truth. I'm just saying that for me, this is the thing that I've struggled the most with, but also found the most rewarding is, is when I can, um, you know, not just accept, but really embrace, uh, you know, the weird parts of me, because oftentimes that's what makes you unique. But also if you can tap into that and use it in the right way, that's, you can, like I say, become your best self, like best true self, I guess. I love it. I really love that. What a unique uh, answer to a question that I've asked 25 times over the past year and a half here. Uh, this, this concept of ego really, and, and how that plays into how we identify as climbers or as people and, and what motivates us. What for you, do, do you recall where you were when you were or a time in your climbing life where you recognized your own specific weirdness and embraced it? <laughs> well, I remember one time when I was still living in Canada, I was, you know, probably more psyched on climbing than, I mean, there, there, was, there was a small group of us and we're all psyched on climbing, but I was known as just being more of a keener than anybody else. And at times, you know, people would poke fun at me for just, you know, wanting to go climbing in the pouring rain and, <clears throat> and stuff like that. But anyway, because of that, not because of any physical talent, I probably got to be, you know, maybe the, the best climber in that, you know, the biggest fish in a very small pond. Um, sure. And at that time, I guess maybe there was like a number of things that happened because of that. But basically, it became a more competitive um, atmosphere. And at times there was some animosities and um, 
I don't want to say it was just jealousy. It just it became more competitive, and and I I dove into climbing in in large part because I didn't like competitive sports. It just didn't mm-hmm. bring out the best in me. At any rate, I saw myself reacting to that competition and that you know wanting to be better than somebody else by um, leaving Squamish for a while. And uh, I'd, I'd gotten into soloing at that point, and I went down to Leavenworth in eastern Washington and just went soloing on the local crags, but then also going up into the mountains and, and soloing some of the alpine rock routes there and just left everything behind. And I did that because I just felt the, the negative parts of competition. Competition can be a good thing. It can bring out the best in some people, but I felt it was – Climbing was turning into just another sport, and I didn't like that. And my knee-jerk reaction was to go in the opposite direction and just leave all of that and everyone behind and just go off by myself. And that was an enlightening thing. All the the uh, parts of climbing that I discovered when I first got into it, where I'm just like, this is the biggest world adventure that I can possibly imagine, all that came sort of roaring back. And, um, you know, whether I was on the small crags on, you know, shorter routes or, or big alpine rock routes, it was just like, this is it. This is, this is what I was looking for, even though I didn't know it before I got into climbing. And it certainly was it once I, once I started climbing, even though I, I've constantly changed in my climbing. At times I've gotten way into soloing and at times I've been into sport climbing. And that, that realization really helped me to sort of make sure that whenever I felt that um, I needed to move in a different direction, that's what I did. And so where some people, they specialize in one area and, you know, it seems to work for them. For me, ignoring what other people say and just going, you know, this is the funnest thing I can imagine. This is the coolest thing I can imagine doing and, and heading in that direction. Oh, man, I really dig that advice. I think it's so great. I think I often have to remind myself and, and maybe uh, listeners will relate to this as well, that for 99.9% of us, Climbing's supposed to be fun. Yeah. Like our bills don't depend on how hard we climb. Our mortgage isn't isn't based on, you know, there's a few people out there, some of the guests in my show, where there are some pressures maybe to perform. But for almost everybody else, climbing is our outlet. It's the yeah. thing that, you know, should bring a lot of joy. And with joy um, and, and passion about a sport can come some struggle and some expectation because you want to perform and you want to motivate yourself to work hard. But that perspective there, I think, is really good to, if nothing else, if you're starting to feel uh, like the joy isn't in the climbing or the training, to find that spark that first connected you to the sport. So let's nerd out for a second then, if we can. Let's talk about training for a bit here. And is there is there an area of training that you have or that you do struggle with? I mean, just like in the last year or so, I've done a bit of training, but realistically, uh, climbing has just been my training. I've I've been super low tech, Um, so I am no expert at all. Probably the the closest thing I've done to training, I I, I guess, I mean, the thing is, is there's a training effect to, I just came back from walking my dog. There is a training effect in all kinds of things, but organized training is something that um, I've done very little of, Um, but there was a time... Um, I think it was, bas- it was basically right around the time where I moved from Canada down to the States. But basically, I, I, was, I was up in Squamish, and I would just, I, I sort of felt like Yosemite was the center of the universe. And so all my time in Squamish, not all, most of it, was for getting ready for, for being in Yosemite. And so there was about five or six climbs that I felt was like the best 511 finger crack, the best overhanging face climb. And there's like about five different climbs, and I would just go to those and just do laps up and down, never stepping onto the ground, never pulling over the top. And then I would just go to the next one. And um, and in particular, there, there was one climb that I think probably did more than the others. Certainly, I focused on it more than the others, where I, would, I just felt like I could, it was overhanging 511 climbing, and I could just, it, initially, I could climb up and down for, you know, maybe 20 minutes, and then that went up to an hour and then two hours. And then finally I would just go and lose count of how many times I did it and just go until I had no skin left on my hands. And that was probably the only bit of training that I sort of came up with that had such a noticeable effect. 
because when I went to Yosemite, I on-sighted the first five 13s I'd ever done, and I I couldn't seem to get tired. It was it was uh, it, it was sort of a caveman type of training because there was nothing I hadn't there was no science behind it. It was simply I just climbed until I ran out of skin. Um, but the the effect of it was that when I got down to Yosemite. Uh, Climbs that I had never thought were even realistic for me to try just um, just felt, I don't want to say easy, but certainly that uh, endurance just wasn't restricting what I was able to do. Yeah, you know, Emily Harrington spoke with me a lot about um, essentially creating that bulletproof level of endurance by dialing in the easier or more moderate pitches, like when she was doing Golden Gate in a day. Um, she she did focus on the the tough high cruxes, of course, the Golden Desert and the A5 Traverse. But she said, in order to have the gas to be able to do those high cruxes, she needed to become incredibly efficient on the more moderate terrain that came before that. And I can see how your training there, doing those up down laps on moderate terrain, would help you to essentially then show up in the valley and flash these much harder grades, which of course is kind of bonkers in and of itself. And I want to talk more about that in, in tactics and um, later on in this conversation, but. Coming back to training, you know, when I spoke with Jordan Cannon, speaking of Golden Gate in a day, uh, when I spoke with Jordan, he said that, you know, one of the biggest pieces of advice that he got early as a climber was from you, and that if he wanted to get good on these big Yosemite climbs, that he should also focus very much on strength as developed in sport climbing, which kind of comes as a surprise, I think, maybe for, for people who on the outside would see the type of climber that that you are doing incredible mileage in these traverses and this kind of thing that you would recommend sport climbing so how do you see sport climbing as a mode of training in general and also for doing these bigger objectives these bigger walls yeah um sport climbing is a different type of uh, a, d a different type of training but i mean that's sort of an integral part of, of any training is working on your weaknesses and making sure there's variety, that you don't just stick with one type of training for a long period of time. But back to what you're saying about um, that being super efficient on the easier climbing. I mean, the thing is, is that's a truism, not just with climbing El Cap, it's also a truism in, uh, in sport climbing. Like say, for instance, that project that you've got in the red. Now, if, if you are inefficient on like the easiest moves, it's just going to take a little bit more out of you. I mean, when I get on the mm. hardest pitches that I've ever done, I'm trying to make the 5-9 five, nine five, nine moves 5-8. I'm trying to make the 5-10 moves 5-9. I'm trying to make the hard 5-11 moves as easy 5-11 as I can. I'm trying to make everything as, as easy as I possibly can. And so, um, yeah, big mistake, I think, in, is... Uh, just focusing on the crux and then being sloppy on the easier climbing. And then it isn't just a matter of saving strength. If you're not concentrating on the easier climbing and your feet are slipping, well, subconsciously up higher, you're not going to trust your feet quite as much. You're going to hold on a little bit tighter. And so trying to climb like absolutely excellently on the easiest part of, of the pitch or the route, you know, pays dividends, you know, once you get to the, to the hardest moves on the climb. Such excellent advice there, Peter. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I have heard that from a few other very thoughtful climbers on this show, especially when it comes to big walls, but also equating it to sport or even boulder. If you're on a 10 pitch or a 10 bolt or a 10 move problem, dialing in some of the easier moves or the easier sections will just leave you that much more gas to when you hit that, uh, that limit section or move. So I love that. And I think I, I actually want to revisit some of that in the tactics chapter. But before we, we close up training here, I wanted to ask you about John Backer and uh, training with him, climbing with him. He was just an absolute monster, of course, so strong and really, I think, pretty revolutionary, you know, with the Backer ladder there and, uh, you know, in Camp 4 and this kind of thing. Uh, I'm wondering if you ever trained with John, you know, non-climber training. And also he, he's got this quote there. He said, I don't train so that I can do the moves. I train so that I know that I can do the moves, essentially overtraining. 
so that when he would get out there on a really tough climb, especially a solo where there is incredibly high consequence to not being able to do a move, he would have way more than he needed in order to be able to do it and the confidence as well. And is that is that kind of a training protocol that you followed as well, or was that specific to John? Uh, okay, so I when he was doing all that stuff, you know, I just shook my head and you know, headed for the crags. Um, he was <laughs> he was way ahead of all of us as as far as training goes. And I remember um, I've I've rarely soloed with anybody else, but John was one of the very few people I could solo with, and uh, and it didn't mess with my head. Usually, I didn't want to solo even near somebody else just because um, it kind of creeped me out. But he was so solid that sometimes we'd go soloing together. But um, and we would just do tons of pitches um, at some of the crags in in Yosemite. But I remember one time we went to this thing called the Knobby Wall, and we were just going to go top roping on it. It's just like this really overhanging, super short thing. And I got on one of the easier routes there. I can't remember easy five twelve or something like that. And I, I think maybe I barely did it, but he was just astonished at how weak I was. You know, he says, how can you climb 511 cracks all day long and, you know, basically thrash your way up something like this? He was brutally honest, but it was, it was super true. Um, but for me, it, uh, I, I would have done well to do at least some of the stuff like he was doing. But my focus really was on... Uh, on long routes, on long crack, and in basically in North America, particularly in Yosemite, mostly that means long crack routes. But in the way that you're talking about with John and how he said, I just don't want to be strong enough. I want to know that I'm strong enough. I want to feel basically that I have, you know, a lot in reserve. And so I, I can relate to that in the way that, say, when I um, first sold Asterman, I mean, it was sort of normal for me to go to places like the Cookie and Arch Rock, where there's a lot of you know steep, three four pitch, uh, five eleven, finger cracks and stuff, and I would you know go do forty or fifty pitches, and it was just it wasn't like a really big day. That was just you know that was just a day out at the crags. And anyway, what I, what I'm doing is or just <laughs> apart from spraying, <laughs> is yeah. is just saying by the time I got to Astro Man, it was just kind of like. You know, before I actually jumped on to Astro Man, earlier in the morning, you know, I went down and did, uh, you know, some multi-pitch 511 crags or routes. Partly in a way of, like, historically, I, I did some solos of some routes that Backer done. And when he did them, they were kind of landmark 511 solos. And uh, I sort of felt like, historically, that was kind of a cool thing to do, but it was also a good way to warm up. For me, going to Astro Man, I wanted to make sure that fitness wasn't even any kind of an issue at all. And I also would have viewed it as a, a total failure if when I got to the top, I was tired at all. And um, yeah, when I got to the top, it was just like more energy than when I started. So yeah, that same thing that what you're talking about was John, where he said he wanted, in, in essence, he wanted to be way more than fit enough for, for what he was going to do. There's definitely like a commonality there between you and, and Honold in this concept of getting to the top of uh, a big solo objective for you, Astro Man, or the Rostrum, and for him doing El Cap via the free rider and and having essentially more energy at the top than when you left the ground. I remember, you know, you see Alex, I think famously in in the film Free Solo, talking about how he was just ready to climb it again. Or, you know, he he went down and he did some hangboarding. And I, I love the sense of being so prepared that you can get to the top. And just be ready to keep on going. And obviously that comes with a ton of preparation. I'm curious, uh, we've talked a little bit about Astro Man here. When when you did that, I, I believe I recall reading that you were just flying through, I'm sure just like in a flow state, but that, you know, part of the way through you kind of stopped and you said, okay, I, I've got to really enjoy this. I mean, you were doing something incredibly groundbreaking, uh, but you you also had the foresight to just stop and and essentially smell the roses a little bit on route. Is that right? Yeah. I, I mean, for, for me on Astro Man, I think I was so psyched that I started to get a bit too amped up, not like in a sketchiness way, but I, I realized I, I was climbing a bit too fast to really enjoy it. And I was just like, I got to really take this in 
And uh, so at a certain point, about two thirds of the way up, or maybe a bit less, there were still some more 511 pitches up higher, but um, I stopped on a, a ledge and took off my shoes. And, and, you know, I'm just like, it was like this ideal that I'd had ever since I was a little kid watching Tarzan movies. I'm up there and I got like, you know, some red Adidas running shorts on, no shirt. I've taken off my shoes. There's nobody else on the wall. And I'm just checking out where I'm in. And you're surrounded by all this orange streaked granite walls just overhanging above you. And I'm just like in this super cool place. And I just hung out there for a little while, looking over at Half Dome and checking out where I was. And then put on my shoes and, and just slow down enough to just to really um, imprint it on my mind and to really take it in so that, um, and so that I wouldn't lose it. I mean, at, at that point, probably more than any other part of the climb was when I was sitting there, I, I, I was watching these birds come flying by and stuff. I felt like I belonged there like they did. I sort of it felt like I was just another animal up there, just hanging out in this incredible environment. But yeah, over-preparing allows you to do that instead of just trying to survive it. All right, Peter, let's talk about nutrition now. And a lot has changed in the sport as well as just our understanding of nutrition and fueling and that kind of thing. So I'm interested, uh, before we dive in specifically, is there an area or has there been an area of nutrition that has been a struggle for you? In, in some ways, it's, it's almost just like a constant struggle to try to find out what works best. And what works best at any one time is not going to work best all the time. Mm. Um, there is no one way of eating that's going to be perfect from childhood to old age. It's, it's constantly tweaking and, and finding the best way to, um, you know, get the best out of yourself. There was this one time I was out in Eastern Canada climbing uh, with a buddy. And actually, I was mostly climbing by myself. But this one day, and, and at that time, I was super strict with my diet. I didn't eat any sugar, any junk food, um, any fat. Uh, and uh, and anyway, so this one day, I came back from climbing and I had um, forgotten to bring any lunch. And it was late in the evening and I was just starving. And I get back to his place. He's gone. I don't know where he was. Anyway, I figured, okay, I got to go to the store and get some get some food, but I'll, I'll just eat something out of his his fridge. I looked in his fridge in his typical bachelor's fridge. You know, there's some old mustard and mayonnaise and a few other creepy things in there. And I'm right. kind of like, oh man, I'm just wasted. I, I got to psych up and, and go to the store. And then I, just before I left, I, I, I look in the freezer and there's uh, this, I don't know, quart of ice cream. And I'm like, well, I don't eat ice cream. So um, uh, I guess I'm just going to have to go to the store. And I'm still trying to psych up. And I'm like, I'll just have a spoonful of ice cream just to get the energy to go shopping. And, you know, that went down. You know, basically the whole quart went down. I ate, ate the whole quart of ice cream. And I'm just like, okay, now I've got the energy to go to the store, but I'm just filled with self-loathing. I'm just like, I polluted my temple. I'm, you know, I suck. I'm probably going to suffer for, you know, the next couple of days is from eating this horrible food. Anyway, so I, I go to the store, get a bunch of groceries, fill up his, his refrigerator. And the next day I wake up and I'm kind of, feel pretty good. And that day I could not get tired. I felt so strong. And I just, I just felt like unstoppable. I felt like I was on some, you know, super steroid uh, and cocaine. Yeah. And I mean, just a yeah. whole bunch of performance enhancing drugs. And I just, I could not get tired. Now, what I learned from that? Well, no, I, I didn't learn that I should eat ice cream every day. And that, that's the way I'll climb way better. It's just sometimes, you know, um, being too neurotic about one way of eating can hurt you. And then also sometimes just going off the reservation. And at times that might mean uh, changing your diet or just in, in the short term, just um, eating junk food. Or I guess my main point is that I've never found a single way of eating that is the perfect way to go 100% of the time. And I think... Uh, using some kind of variety and restraint at some times and then blowing off the restraint at other times and um, embracing the horror of, of eating a whole quart of ice cream in one sitting. What was the flavor of ice cream? I think it was like vanilla. I hate vanilla ice cream. It was some, some ice cream that it was just, I was just starving. And it, it wasn't like it was my favorite type of ice cream. It was just, it was just what was there. You probably just burned like 
you know, 6,000 calories out climbing that day and, and you just needed something. Uh, Peter, I'm, I'm so glad that you just shared that, that anecdote. First of all, I've never heard that, I've, I've, you know, in the interviews that I've researched on you and read and, and that I've, I've never heard that. So that was a delightful little look inside of um, a young Peter Croft's life. But also, I think it, it underscores an interesting point and, and an important point in nutrition here, especially in our sport where there has been a lot of struggle with eating disorders and uh, a huge emphasis on strength to weight ratio and, and this kind of thing. And, you know, maybe more so in comp and, and sport climbing than big wall, multi-pitch type climbing where where really you do it's more like a marathon right where you just really need to fuel like crazy i remember emily harrington talking about like eating a burrito on golden gate just to to stay fueled but still it it just it highlights i think a very important aspect that a not only should we maybe not get too dogmatic with our nutrition at any one time because it's all an experiment and it's not there's not a stasis things change our nutrition and our needs change um, so I think that's that's an important perspective that you share there, but also this permission to allow ourselves to mess around and have junk food and try new things, and it's not going to ruin our climbing forever, right? If if we fluctuate in what we're eating or our weight or any of this stuff, it's it's not going to have some sort of catastrophic effect on our climbing. We're just going to learn something. Yeah. I, I, um... One thing that reminds me, this conversation reminds me of uh, talking to John Backer. And I remember him saying that, you know, he, like I say, he was way ahead in training than anybody I ever met at that, that, that time. And he said at one point, he uh, figured, okay, you know, I'm going to drop a bunch of weight and just see how my climbing is. And to a certain point, his climbing got maybe a, a little bit better. And then he, he dropped another 10, 15 pounds or something like that. And he said that, you know, he saw his climbing performance drop off and his endurance drop off. And so then he just, you know, it, it, it wasn't about trying to look good in, in skinny jeans. It was just like purely just pragmatic. What is the best thing for my climbing? So then he put back on the 10 to 15 pounds and climbed much better. And so, um, you know, experimenting with yourself, uh, and again, you, you can take information from other people, but it, it's, it's way more valid if you found it out on your own. All right, let's talk about tactics and technique a little bit here, Peter. And I, I kind of want to kick this chapter off here by juxtaposing, if we could, big multi-pitch soloing and sport climbing. And we talked a little bit about that in the training chapter of, of kind of sport climbing, bringing this opportunity to train for these bigger objectives like you did. And what I'm interested in, in learning from you is if you experience the same struggle that I did when I went from trad climbing out west to sport climbing at the red and really dealing with a struggle of not moving fast, not moving dynamically, not taking risks essentially because I didn't want to fall. Yeah, I'm, I remember uh, my first trip down to Australia. I mean, I was I, mostly just soloing down there and I, and I was... Around that time, and that, that there was like a period of years leading up to that as well, where most, of, by far most of the climbing I was doing was soloing. Then getting on climbs, even if the bolt was at my chest, pushing myself to the point of falling was just like a, a dyno was incredibly hard to get myself to, to go for. Um, but I, I, I was super lucky in Australia. I, I uh, met up with this guy, Jeff Wigand, who was the best Australian climber. And him and I would just have these huge soloing days out in the crags and it was super fun. Just um, that, that was an instance of where competition was at its best because it was super fun. Neither one of us wanted to be better than the other. We're, we're, we're kind of like racing each other in a way. Like, you know, he would run ahead and go up one route. I'd run ahead of him and do another route. And it was just all day long. It's an incredibly long cliff band at Mount Arapiles. And anyway, that was super fun. But he, he was, uh, he climbed a lot harder than me on a rope. And I remember we went up to this one thing that was notorious for having this really big dyno on it and he was trying to teach me how to dyno and I just kept on holding back and um, eventually sort of the, at the end of the session I'm just kind of like I cannot get myself to go for it he says okay well just uh, you know go up um, have one more run and then um, uh, just thread the rope on the ring bolt and and just clean the draws off and so 
with all of this sort of pressure off and stop worrying about success and went up there. And it was, I understood the idea of the dead point where I just launched and it seemed like I stopped in midair and was able to reach over, grab the hold, adjust it a little bit, and then drop down onto it. And it was such a big breakthrough that I learned, in, it, in a way, it was such a big breakthrough that it had a bigger impact than it might have done if I had learned it over a longer period of time. And so it taught me this is something I really need to get better at. Not, not when I'm soloing. I don't want to dyno when I'm soloing, but on rope climbing. Um, but it was such a, you know aha moment. And, you know, it, it sort of enlightened me or re-enlightened me to the idea that don't just work on your strengths. Find the stuff that you completely suck at and, uh, and go after that as well. Did you then take that kind of aha moment back to California or BC and consciously try to push yourself out of that comfort zone and do more dynamic style climbing? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In places like Smith Rocks and and uh, in Squamish and, and in Yosemite, but particularly with, with sport climbing. It just, re it, 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 it helps in crack climbing quite often too, um, on hard crack routes, you know, dynoing for, for jams. But with that, you have to be even more precise because you're not just, you, you can't afford to just overshoot it like you can in, 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 on a face hold. You have to dyno right into the thin finger jam or whatever. But yeah, I, I definitely embrace that. And, and uh, I, you know, I, I also just knew as with anything else, you know, mileage is, is what sort of imprints it on you and, and makes it, uh, makes your technique solid and also uh, instinctual so that you don't have to think about it. It's just what you naturally do in a situation that calls for it. Mileage is what imprints it. I love that. And you are the king of mileage. So uh, clearly you're imprinting a lot. It, that kind of brings up this, this notion that we touched on earlier as well, which was down climbing and speaking of mileage just you know you're doing 50 60 70 pitches a day oftentimes you're going up and you're coming down just as a matter of uh, necessity when you're out soloing sometimes because you're backing off of a climb sometimes because you're again just trying to get in that great mileage and so i, I want to touch on down climbing specifically for a second here because it's just not something that a lot of climbers tend to do. Sometimes at the gym, you're on an auto belay, you'll do some up downs and that kind of thing. But I, I rarely down climb anything when I'm outside. Never, maybe almost never. Uh, and I'm curious, tactically speaking, what advantages you found from all of the down climbing that you've done? It teaches you a lot more about movement. And, and for me, probably in particular with crack climbing, what I got out of the climbing up and down in, in particular, the down climbing was the importance of maximizing reach. And what that meant was, was most people when they crack climb finger and hands, they go thumbs down, okay? Most of the time because you get extra natural torque on it, extra, extra natural right. camming action going on. But it also means that you can't reach nearly as far and it also means that you're using more strength. I've actually, you know, checked it out on various climbs where if I go thumbs up, I can reach almost twice as far as I can when I'm going thumbs down. So no kidding. It ends up being a hold that is less strenuous, and I can reach almost twice as far, which means I can do the climb with less effort, and I can do it in less time. So if endurance is any kind of a factor, and you know, and unless you're a cyborg, it you know it does matter. Uh, that kind of thing makes a huge difference. But that was something I learned from climbing down. I didn't, I use it a ton climbing up now, but I learned it going down because if I was on a hard finger hand crack or whatever, and I was reaching down underneath an overhang and it was a tricky move, well, I would milk the last good uh, jam. And then the way I could do the biggest reach to reach way down to the, to the next really good jam, if I go, it went thumbs up, I didn't have to do these really, uh, these intermediate technical moves, I could just make one massive move and uh, and get through it. And in the long term, later on, you know, sometimes I'd be climbing with other people, you know, we're just out cragging at some place. And, you know, they were accomplished crack climbers, particularly with short cruxes, I would end up feeling like I cheated because I didn't have to do the crux moves that they were doing because I would just milk the last really good jam and then just make, you know, go thumbs up and make a huge reach. 
and avoid it. Yeah, if you can if you can do a half the moves or a third of the moves, you're either yeah. going to be able to do it a lot faster or you're just going to have more gas in the tank. Would you recommend essentially practicing down climbing? And is that valuable? Is it more valuable for crack climbing than it would be for face climbing? Or is there value in down climbing for both? There's value every which way. I mean, for one thing, trying to stay alive and be safe. You know, you get up into a situation where you realize I have no gear left or I dropped, you know, some of the gear. I Now I can't protect this next place. If I go any further, um, if I fall off, I'm just going to hit the ground. And so being able to down climb and not feel like, oh, crap, you know, this is it's basically panic starts to seep in and you're freaking out because you've never done any down climbing. I've been one pitch from the top of multi-pitch routes before where it starts raining and I just start down climbing and it's just like, well, it's just what it is, you know, and, and through soloing and, and particularly doing those laps up and down um, in all kinds of situations where even if I got, you know, close to the top of the climb and maybe the crux was wet or for whatever reason, I felt like I had to go down. And if I climbed, say, five pitches up and couldn't do the last pitch and then climb five pitches down, my take on it was you know, climb 10 pitches today. Okay, what's next? Not like, oh, crap, you know, I failed, I suck, you know, all kinds of negative reinforcement. Instead, I just viewed it as, you know, that's great. I've done 10 pitches. So it wasn't like success or failure meant so much. It was more just staying safe and having fun and doing a ton of pitches in a day. It's really solid advice, I think, there, not just on practicing down climbing. In fact, practicing anything with regard to what do I do if something goes sideways is, of course, fantastic tactical advice, uh, but also just the the technique that you're learning from the down climbing there is just different. It's a different way of utilizing our minds and our muscle memory and our technique to find some efficiencies. Also really like the opinion there, Peter, of if you get up four pitches on a five pitch and you down climb, that's not a failure. It's just four extra pitches that you just got to do, framing it around getting the climbing in, getting the movement over rock as opposed to any sort of objective, I think is really great. I want to talk more about that in the mental game chapter. But first, I want to touch on link ups. And this is an area where you were certainly a pioneer. There just wasn't a lot of people doing link ups back in kind of the day when you were breaking into them. And the one that comes to mind, I think most significantly and famously is, uh, of course, doing uh, Half Dome and El Cap in a day. You did the nose and then Half Dome, I think was the order, right? With John Backer. And now it's a little bit more common to see some of these big link-ups or endurance types records being broken or speed records. Tommy and Alex, of course, come to mind. You held the speed record on the nose with Hans Florin for many years, in fact. And You've just done uncountable link-ups. And so I want to know, A, why you're drawn to that in some sense, but B, uh, specifically looking at doing the nose and half dome in a day with John Backer, tactically speaking, what did that take? Uh, since there wasn't really a roadmap for what you guys were doing at the time. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really think in terms of tactics at all. Um, John had it. He was, you know, he had a, a strong background in mathematics and he's definitely... Had it sort of figured out, okay, you lead this section and I'll lead this section and we'll move together on the, these other sections. Um, but it wasn't really um, thought out that, that, that much. And, and realistically, the, the thing that tactically was uh, the biggest mistake was I completely sucked at um, Jumari. I was just uh -huh. terrible at that it, to the point where John's like, what's the deal with your Jumari? And I'm like, maybe it'd be just faster if I if you just... If I just climbed instead of uh, Jumaring and right. convinced me that probably wasn't the greatest idea. But yeah, th that one was uh, like, it, it was one of those magic, magical days. Like I've done big link ups where I'm just cooked at the end. And that one, it was, uh, I mean, it, I think that's for me, a big part of climbing is is searching for those those magic moments. And that was one of them where climbing just gave us energy all day long. I, I just felt like we were just getting stronger and stronger. And even after we hiked down after doing Half Dome, after the second route, back down the valley floor, I was just kind of buzzing. Just, I was, I just had so much energy, but that, you know, I don't remember much about any tactics. There really wasn't very much at all, but it really was just one of those days where uh, I'd been dreaming of doing that climb for a number of years. I didn't even know John Backer um, and somehow he found me 
and and I, back to this whole link up thing, I was doing a lot of solo link ups in the valley. I I wasn't hanging out with anybody. I wasn't telling anybody what I was doing, and somehow he had found out and and figured I was like, you know, a good choice for for going for the link up. And you know, it was the climb I'd been dreaming about more than anything else. I somebody had offered me a million bucks and a, a bucket full of Olympic medals to you know go do something different. I would have tossed that aside and 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 gone for for the link up for sure because it was just it wasn't just coolest thing I could think of in Yosemite. It was the coolest thing I could think of in the universe. All right, my man, we're jamming our way into the mental game chapter. I'm so psyched to crack open this noggin of yours. Such an accomplished soloist, such an accomplished big wall climber, link up, heady onsider, so much mental game. In all that you do, we've, of course, talked about the importance of training and, and tactics and even eating pints of ice cream to gain a nutritional edge, but I feel like mental game here is going to be rich territory. I've got some specifics I want to dive into, but first, let me just zoom out and, and let's go general. Is there an area of your mindset, of the mental game, um, that comes to mind as a struggle or, or that has been a struggle for you? Yeah, I, I think to a certain extent... Um... In mind struggle is more like attention span. You know, I'm not very good at focusing on one project for any amount of time. Um, you know, backing up a little bit to what I was saying a minute ago about uh, um, inspiration. And that for me has is, is just been so key, whether it's, you know, one pitch cragging or climbing a big wall or a big link up or a big ridge traverse. Sticking with any one thing for a long period of time you know, has, has, has been a, a struggle for me. Um, but at the same time, I think searching for those, you know, ephemeral moments where you just all of a sudden you light up. Um, there's been just so many instances where I've, I just feel like I've been really pretty mediocre for stretches of time. And then all of a sudden um, I see something or an idea pops into my head and I just get super energized and I feel like it's a chance of a lifetime. Not just like, oh, this would be impressive if I, if I did this climb or it would be cool to climb at that grade, but more like this is such an unbelievable opportunity I've got here. Yeah, that's interesting. Kind of this, the elusive nature of the psych and, um, you know, some, some seasons were, were just laser focused and super psyched on something, some, some not. It's interesting to hear that, of course, that's something that uh, has been a struggle for you as well. How do you handle that? And, and is this... Are we talking about, you know, days or, or weeks or months of lulls? What do these, these periods feel like for you? Sometimes it could be months for sure where, you know, I'm just, I'm having a lot of fun. It's not like I'm not having any fun. It's, it, no, it's great. Climbing is, is fantastic even when it's not magical. You know, and, and realistically it was magical all the time. It, that would almost by definition mean it wasn't magical anymore. You know, finding those, those singular moments where, it it not only is it makes you believe that you're something better than yourself, but also it can be instructive as far as um, a direction that you might want to continue to go in. As a, as a for instance, that time where I went to Leavenworth to get away from the competition, pursuing that idea of big ridge traverses, um, that's sort of where I started. Yeah, that really seemed like a formative time for you going down there and and getting away from not only the competition, but just other climbers and, and really focusing on your soloing. And so I'd like to just dive right into soloing here for a second. We're in the mental game chapter. This was a very interesting conversation and chapter that I had with Alex Honnold last season. And he even theorized a bit that soloing, at least big soloing, kind of events like he did on El Cap might be going the way of the dinosaur because it doesn't seem like there's a new guard of soloists kind of moving up. Of course, that could change, but his thought was maybe people are going to be more focused on pushing the limit in sport climbing or bouldering and that kind of thing. And I think what's interesting, Peter, is that soloing isn't as uncommon as maybe people think it is. I think for people on the outside, they think there's one person who free solos and it's Alex Honnold and he did that movie. And even within the climbing community, it may not be as commonly understood that there are guys and gals who are, you know, in, in the valley at Yosemite, working in the village or, or at a coffee shop, 
and they want to get a bunch of pitches in before they clock in. And so they'll just run up five or six pitches that are within their limit and then clock in to work. And so I don't really want to crack open this huge argument on either side of should people be allowed to solo or not. Obviously, you have gained an incredible amount of enjoyment and uh, inspiration and fulfillment from soloing, as do many other climbers. So speaking to the community that's listening right now who are interested in soloing, who do feel called to that, who are excited about the experience of climbing in that nature. You know, what advice would you have for those climbers? Well, for one thing, when I started climbing with a rope, um, my main goal for the first few years was simply to be good enough to be called a climber. I was convinced I would never be really very good at it. I just knew I loved it. And so that's it was my goal at first. But once I started soloing, it uh, the way I got into it was uh, me and my friends, we would go climbing in Squamish and, and then, uh, you know, mid-afternoon, you know, we'd get stoned and then go to the bakery and, and eat a bunch of pastries. And then this one day I was just like, man, I don't want to stop climbing. And uh, so my friends are like, okay, are you sure about that? You know, they're kind of offering me a joint. And I'm like, no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go climbing. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, I'm just going to go do something super easy. And so there's the apron in, uh, in Squamish. It's just like this five pitch slabby thing. Anyway, so I did, I don't know, maybe like three five pitch routes in, I don't know, a few hours or something like that. And it just blew me away. And these, they're like five, seven routes or five, eight or something like that. Really low level. I was climbing, you know, with a rope, you know, quite a bit harder than that. And I was like, this is unbelievable. And so I stopped doing the afternoon, getting stoned and eating donut thing. And uh, I was just like, I can climb this much in a few hours. What could I do if I, you know, spent all day doing this? But anyway, my point was, is for the first number of years, I wasn't trying to solo anything hard. It was just, it was just so much fun. And it was also the perfect thing to do. It's just, it's kind of like whatever you're talking about, learning how to drive or learning a new language is you don't, you know, pick up a, a medical journal and try to learn Russian. And you don't get onto a racetrack when you're just learning how to drive. You just do a bunch of, of mellow stuff. And certainly, you know, in any situation where there's an element of risk. And so doing a ton of easy stuff and also feeling really comfortable down climbing. Yeah, essentially not trying to do anything spectacular or noteworthy. You're you're looking at it as doing very very within your limit climbing, of course, because the consequences are the highest they could possibly be if a mistake is made. Yeah, what I see as as the biggest problem and it's a scary one of people kind of like in the same way that they might, you know, lead their first 511 face climb or finger crack and people go, wow, that's, that's really cool. Wanting that kind of uh, ego stroking, you know, by soloing something and, and soloing something impressive. So people go, wow, you're, you're, you're an amazing guy. It, it's like, you know, obviously a deadly dangerous game if you do it like that. And for me, as I progressed through the grades, I never felt like this was something you know, sketchy or anything. Cause I just, in the same way, like we were talking about sort of over preparing for a big solo where your fitness is much, much more than what it needs to be. It's the same thing in a way with the, the, the mindset and the fitness for, for, you know, getting into solo at a, soloing at all is just feeling like you've got tons in reserve and it, and it isn't just about finger strength. Obviously I remember when I was uh, just getting into climbing, reading books by Reinhold Messner, and he was talking about how he would at the beginning of each season, he'd go to university during the winter. And then in the, in the early season, he would go solo just these super classic, easy free climbs, multi-pitch free climbs. And they were like historically important, but they were really old and, and they really weren't very hard at all. But he said at the beginning of each season, it was super important to do that. So for myself, there's been at times where I haven't soloed for say like a bunch of months and then I've gotten back into it. And even if I'm in really good sport climbing shape, I have to drop the grade way, way down, like to super easy stuff and just do some mileage. And um, I mean, as a, for instance, I remember one time uh, running into Alex in the Owens Gorge and he had just come out from, I think he's spent the winter in, in Vegas and he's soloing some like five sevens and five eights. He's just going up and down and up and down as, you know, he'd spent all winter long just climbing in, indoors 
And so he was getting, you know, back into the, the flow of soloing. And so getting that, that mental game going again, super important. And then you start bumping it up and bumping it up. And so it doesn't feel like a big deal if you're a thousand feet up. Yeah, that makes that makes so much sense to me. In theory, you know, I mean, it, it's it's not something that I've that I've put to practice, but I can I can see how. I mean, Alex has got the nickname "No Big Deal" because he's he works himself to the point, it works himself up to the point, and prepares to the point where things look like they're no big deal. People don't see all the stuff behind the scenes of how how he trains during the winter, how strong he gets, and then putting in the time to get mentally into the into the game. I mean, you know. He put a ton of time into working on those 511 slabs low down on, on free rider, you know, on a rope. And he knew that was super crucial. Yeah, absolutely. And just hearing you share about him doing five sevens, five eights, it, it, it really foundationally helps to, for the rest of us to understand the work that goes into yeah. building the confidence in the toolkit. Is there, for you in your mind, is there a like an upper limit of a grade at which you would solo versus what you wouldn't? Or is it all specifically subjective based on the route, the style, you know, your fitness, that kind of thing? I never really got into practicing a rock climb so that I could solo it. So there's plenty of climbs I've soloed that I'd done before with a rope, but I didn't go and practice it on a rope so that I could solo it. So... As far as the grade goes, it, 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 it's a lot more about, can I make this solid? You know, most of the hardest solos I've done have been crack climbs where I feel like I'm plugged in, where I don't have to worry about a, a face hole breaking off, that sort sure. of thing. So it's, there's, I remember this one climb up in, in Washington where um, I got past all the hard climb. And I got to this 5-6 uh, move and you have to use this flake and there, I could see chalk around it but it was detached all the way around. I, I banged on it and it seemed like it was solid enough that I just just figured, you know, 99% sure that flake won't break off, but there's that 1% and so I downclimbed. Had to, you know, downclimb, you know, maybe like four pitches to get out of there and it was like the easiest part of the whole climb, but I just wasn't, I wasn't willing to, to you know, trust that 1%. Well, this brings up a really good point, Peter, because I, I've heard you say, in the past that uh, when it comes to soloing, one needs to get really good at chickening out. And we've talked a little bit about ego here. So so what does that mean? Well, in a way, I'm sort of making fun of myself with saying, calling it chickening out because I don't view it that way at all. Like I said before, you know, if I climb four pitches up on a five pitch route and chicken out and go down, I go, okay, four pitches up, four pitches down. I've done eight pitches today. You know, that's great. I'll just keep on going. So I don't look at it in, in a negative way. Um, but just being really matter of fact, you know, if it's a super easy move, but it's, it's loose or wet or whatever, viewing climbing up and climbing down as the same thing, not, not getting hung, hung up on success as a way to measure progress or, 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 or what's a good day. I've had plenty of good days where, you know, I backed off things and then climbed something, you know, that maybe wasn't even that hard, but maybe it was wet and it was some slabby insecure move and it was soaking wet. So I down climb and then later in the day, solo something much harder. So I don't view it. I don't go, oh, I'm climbing terribly. So because I, I backed off a route that isn't very hard, I, I need to blow it off for the day. It's just like, no, that was, was the right decision to make. And, and, you know, part of that comes probably from going in and soloing laps up and down things where it's legit, you know, soloing down is just as legit as, as soloing up. So Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, being way up on a climb, you know, a thousand feet up and just kind of going, yeah, I don't like to look at this weather. I'll just down climb and not go, oh crap, I'm going to have to down climb. And, and that uh, even failure can be, it's success in a way. I mean, in a <laughs> very real way as far as uh, survival goes. Yeah, we define, we define success. I mean, climbing is, is such a personal sport. There's, there's no bag of money at the top. And so ultimately we define what success is, a lot of climbers, myself included, can fall into the trap of setting goals that are either achieving a certain grade or achieving clipping chains or topping out a certain route. And then you can get a little down or disappointed on yourself if it doesn't go well. And it sounds like you've had quite a bit of success redefining what success is, in fact. And it's not necessarily getting to the top of every route that you pull onto, but maybe it's just climbing, learning a skill, getting some fitness, making the right call, 
to yeah. bail four pitches up a five pitch route. And and I assume that takes some practice because for me, at least, you know, I, I, I think I still need to learn a lot uh, when, when it comes to that. Yeah. I mean, there's been plenty of times where people heaped praise on somebody doing something that was actually really stupid and they just got away with it. And mm -hmm. then other times kind of going, oh, that's too bad you didn't do this thing when you made the perfect choice. And the idea of, of success and failure, I mean, it, 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 the first time I ever really sort of understood that it, it, how there's a, a lot of ways that you can look at success and failure. I, when I was a kid um, in, in my school, I was the best long jumper. And I just would always win. And, you know, I, it wasn't really that big of a competition. And it was, you know, it's a small school, but anyway, I was the best long jumper. And then this, at this one meet, there was, um, all the schools got together and one of the, one of the, uh, people or the long jumpers in, from this other school, he was known as being like by far the best. It was a bigger school and, and all that. Anyway, so at this uh, track meet, uh, I figured nobody else wanted to jump against them because they knew they would lose. And I figured, oh, well, I'll give it a go. So, you know, I jumped and I jumped further than I ever had before. I was just, for some reason or other, I, I was inspired that day. And then he jumped and he easily beat me. And then I remember afterwards um, talking to some of my friends that are like, ah, you, you know, you actually came in last. There's only two of you in the, in the long jump and, and you came in second and you came in last. I mean, that's hilarious. And I also knew that I'd jump further than I ever had before. Like for me, and I was kind of like, okay, they're saying that I failed and I just jumped further than I ever had before. And obviously there's somebody in the world who's going to jump further than me. And, I, and I've seen that in climbing over and over again, what, what other people might view as success and what other people might call a failure and that you can't just take cues from other people, that it's super important that um, you understand where you're coming from and also what is real success? All right, Peter, moving into our final chapter here, uh, which is focused on on purpose and passion. And I kind of want to come at it at a slightly different angle with you here because you just represent this really long lens in climbing and have had such an impact on the sport that I'd like to talk about what kind of comes next and your perspective on the evolution of what it means to be a climber. So speaking to you personally, you just have had I mean, it's it's so apparent after talking for a couple hours here, it's so apparent that your psych is as high now as it probably ever has been. And I want to know where you draw that inspiration. And will you be as psyched on climbing in 10 years and in 20 years and 30 years? Well, you, you could ask my wife about that and she would tell you, yeah, he's just as psyched. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it changes over time. Like, in other words, I've never viewed myself as a soloist or a sport climber or a big wall climber or an alpinist, I'm just, just a climber. And so that changes over time. Yeah. I, I, I think evolving is, is a good way to be, but sort of as far as what I'll be doing, you know, into the future, um, maybe 20 years ago or something like that, I had like this weird health thing going on and, uh, I had all these weird symptoms and right around that time, um, Jackie Onassis got some hideous type of cancer and it's virtually everybody dies from it. And I was watching the news and I'm like, oh my God, I have all those symptoms. And I was just like, oh crap, I've got cancer. I didn't even tell my wife what was, uh, what was going on. I was freaked, went to the doctor, had all these tests and the, the, the tests eventually took weeks to get back and I was freaking out even more. Anyway, the tests came back and they go, something's really wrong with you, but we can't figure out what it is. And they did test for cancer, but they just go, well, we really don't know. Something's really off. And so it, it didn't really help. I'm thinking, okay, I don't know if I've got, you know, six months to live or maybe a little bit more. Basically what it amounted to, I didn't have terminal cancer. I'd been eating too much junk food. And so I switched that around and then, you know, it went away like within 48 hours. But the reason I say all of that so when I thought I had like, you know, months to live, I really wanted to find out what it was like to be a real old guy and just going up some mountain lake and just, you know, walking slowly around the lake and just taking in the mountains and checking it all out. And I'm thinking, man, I'm not going to find out what that's like. I'd really love to find out what that's like. And so 
eventually, maybe that's, that's, uh, that's where I'm headed, you know, for the time being, and I'm still love getting out in the rock. I'm going to get out there in half an hour or something like that. But yeah, you know, evolving and, and, you know, and, and no matter what, that's like something that's really important for all of us to do, not just looking long-term, but even in, in the shorter term, always kind of tinkering and adjusting with, you know, how you might want to train your fingers or eat your breakfast or live your life. You know, it's, it's, there is no one way that's going to work perfectly for everybody. And it's not even one way that's going to work perfectly for one person. You're constantly evolving. And I think that's, it's an important thing to know, but it's also makes it way more fun. Yeah. I really like that. I think it's easier said than done to embrace one's aging and mortality, I think. And, and for, for some that can be really hard. I think about it often, actually, and maybe I just see it more acutely because my kids are growing up and this kind of thing. But, you know, so I'm 43 years old now, Peter. I, I fell in love with climbing fairly recently, you know, relatively speaking, I didn't start climbing until I was 30 and I haven't started like training hard until I was 40. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a noob, right? I'd love to be able to enjoy this sport for 30 more years um, or more. You look at Fred Becky kind of like dragging himself up rocks when he was, you know, in his mid eighties, it's like, you know, it, it can happen. Even, even more than that, go to Europe. And you'll be out of these sport crags and there'll be people who are like way older than you, decades older than you, and they are just cranking. And it's so normal. Like here, we're barely getting out of, I don't even know if we've sort of gotten out of the idea that climbing is an extreme sport. Hmm. It's just, you know, I mean, for some, it's a sport. For myself, it's more like a way of life. But it, over there, it's just what people do. It's, it's so normal. And so it's really normal to see kids with their parents and grandparents out of the crags, you know, getting after it. And here it's, it's still, this is, is kind of like a, a young man or young woman sport. And really, you know, you can do it your whole life. It's, it's certainly less, a, less of an impact sport than mountain biking or skiing or snowboarding and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it's like, so then it's a mindset thing for, for those of us who, who equate climbing with constantly just moving up the ladder of grades or constantly one-upping the season that we had prior or... Climbing is pulling super hard, you know. Um, what what advice do you have for me and for for others who who are kind of in that's that's the world that we're in right now? But but we want to we don't want to burn out. We want to be able to enjoy climbing for another twenty years, thirty years, forty years. Yeah, um, you know, again, everybody's different. But the times where I've gotten hung up on on grades, I plateau out or maybe even start to go down a bit. But if I, if I listen to my body and, and, uh, and, and my psych, and even if all my friends are just psyched to go work on that one project at our local sport climbing area or bouldering or whatever, if that doesn't seem like the funnest thing, go where the fun is. And it seems like such a um, overly simplistic way of looking at things, if, but go where the fun is. And if, if what you're doing at the sport crag isn't fun, move on. Because if, if, if you're just kind of thinking, well, this is what I have to do um, because all my friends are doing this kind of thing. And because I, I've invested a certain amount of time, I kind of feel like I have to do this. You can give maybe 85, 90% if you, if you really, you know, push hard. But if it's the funnest thing in the world, then you can give it, you can easily give it 110%. You can shock yourself by like, holy crap, did I really do that? And that's happened to me like over and over again. And, and we all find that, you know, certain routes that, that, that really speak to you. But if you go where the fun is, and that's when you can give everything to it. And there's, I've been lucky enough a number of times in my climbing, where it's not just kind of like, this is the coolest thing at the crag. I'm thinking this is the best thing in the world. And I'm just lucky enough to be here at this time. And at those times, you become a better version of yourself. Hell yeah. I love it. I love following the fun. That's just great advice. And, and that way, there is no plateau because even if you're climbing 514 and now you're 60 and you're climbing 512 or you're climbing V2, whatever it is, if it's fun, if you're following the fun, then it doesn't matter uh, because you're getting that joy and fulfillment from it. Man, you are like, you just lit from within, Peter, man. I, I just get so psyched every time I talk with you. I feel like um, you're, you're my new therapist. We, I need to set up sessions with you. You bet. <laughs> well, thank you, Peter, so much, man. Just for taking the time, for being as gracious as you've been, but also and especially on behalf of the listeners for the 
contribution that you've made to the sport and that you continue to make. It's just been a real treat, man. Oh, cool. Well, thanks very much. And um, hey, if you're come to Bishop sometime, yeah, give me a shout. It'd be fun to hit the crags. And that wraps up our chat with the truly legendary yet totally humble and joyful Peter Croft. What'd y'all think of this one? Let me know. Peter said he has an Instagram, but it's just a few photos of his dog. So you can find me on IG at The Struggle Climbing Show. You guys, you guys just heard that Peter invited me to go climbing with him, right? Like I can hold him to that? Well, in a second, I am going to not only hit you with my usual takeaways from this fantastic chat, but I'm also going to share how you, yes, you, can climb with the Peter Croft. But first, let's support the awesome brands who are supporting the struggle. Give it up for Fizzy Vantage, the official climbing nutrition sponsor of The Struggle. Y'all, they just released a new greens powder, so you can level up your daily nutrition, and I am telling you, it tastes amazing, and it is packed with fantastic organic whole food nutrients, prebiotics, probiotics, and more. This is by far the best tasting and most affordable daily greens I've ever tried, and it is instantly part of of my daily routine. Check it out along with everything else that they make, which is fantastic. As you all know, you can look for it in Europe from the Epic TV online shop and in the US at select gyms and of course at fizzyvantage.com. Hit that link in your show notes or use code STRUGGLE15 at checkout for 15% off. And a shout out to Petzl for being the official gear sponsor of The Struggle. You can find my favorite harness, the Harunos, at your local gear shop along with their other harnesses, helmets, and draws, all of which have helped me to perform at my best this season. You guys can learn more at Petzl.com to access the inaccessible. And a big chalky fist bump to Friction Labs for helping me and thousands of climbers as well as top athletes to chalk up less and climb more. Pop over to FrictionLabs.com and use code STRUGGLE20 for 20% off your first order. This stuff really helped me out all summer and fall long on my projects, and I think you're gonna see the difference. You can try it risk-free. Chalk up less and climb more with Friction Labs. All right, just tons of takeaways here today with Peter. I mean, it was like sitting down with a hand jamming, super ripped Yoda. Pretty much everything he said was golden in this chat. But for me, you know, it was it was less about the climbing beta, and, and there was tons of climbing beta that I'm gonna implement in my training, and especially in my tactics outside. But but more than that, it was about what it means to be a climber, to be fueled by inspiration. And, and as Peter says, to embrace your weirdness, to become your best true self. And that boils down to following the fun. I mean, who needs food when you got inspiration, right? I mean, a pint of ice cream might give you the energy boost that you need to take on your next 50 pitch day. But aside from that, it is all about following the stoke. And for you, whether that's boulder sets at a gym or cragging or attempting a big link up, I hope that you're following the fun. I sure as hell am. Oh, and speaking of following the fun, how about having a fun day out at the crag with Peter Croft? Yeah, you can do it. I can do it. We can all do it. In fact, as you recall, Jordan Cannon hired Peter as a guide, and that's kind of what kicked off his professional climbing career. And if you want to follow suit, you can. You can actually drop Peter an email and ask him to take you out climbing and he'll figure it out with you. So I'm gonna put his email in the show notes of this episode. And Peter, apologies in advance if you get 5,000 people who wanna come out climbing with you. I wouldn't be surprised if you do, but hey, it'll pay the bills, right? So check the show notes and uh, go grab 50 pitches with Peter. Well, that clips the anchors on this episode, and it also wraps up our 10-show block of regular Season 2 episodes. Now, you know what that means, don't you? Expert analysis episodes are incoming, and I have got some big, big talent coming in to take a scientific look back on where the 10 elite climbers from this season have struggled, what it taught them, and what common themes can be teased out so that we can become stronger in our training, nutrition, tactics, and mental game as a result. That's what the show is all about. That's why I built this format, and it's absolutely killing me, but I swear it's also making me a better climber, and I hope it is for you too. So stay tuned to those expert analysis episodes coming your way. I cannot wait. 
Man, I'm just really grateful for you all as I uh, work my harness off here in the podcast slash utility closet to bring you what I hope you find to be engaging and helpful content as presented by really, really fantastic guests. I'm currently recording this at midnight as my family sleeps, but I am fueled by endless stoke for this stuff and for giving back to the climbing community. So if you'd like to give back to the show in a little way, please consider just coming aboard as a patron. For the price of a cheap beer each month, you will get exclusive access to early and ad-free episodes, pro clinics held by the world's top climbers, and of course, other really cool perks. Plus, you'll be keeping me caffeinated here in the pod closet. You can check it all out at patreon.com slash the struggle climbing show. Thank you. I love ya. Hey, did you know the struggle is carbon neutral in partnership with the Honnold Foundation? They're doing amazing work, y'all, to bring clean energy to communities around the world, including power for 15 rural Ugandan hospitals that otherwise lack electricity. How cool is that? Swing on over to honoldfoundation.org to learn more, to take action, and to support with a tax-deductible donation. Thank you, guys. And lastly, The Struggle's a proud member of the Plug Tone Audio Collective, a diverse group of the best, most impactful podcasts in the outdoor industry. This show was produced and hosted by me, Ryan Devlin. All right, Ferris, hit it. That struggle makes us struggle. Yeah, it does. Let's climb hard and do good things in the world.